Hello and welcome to Women's World. I am Oinlola Sali. Today we'll be looking at women empowerment and its relevance to the African continent. We will meet a phenomenal young woman in our Life on Top segment. We will also bring you up to date with the latest headlines in the world of women. And taking a look at trends, we will have a third eye look on weddings in Nigeria. But first, we go to our issue for the day, women empowerment in Africa. For so long, women in Africa have been seen as homemakers or agriculturists taking the back seat in areas of politics and business. According to the United Nations, women work two-thirds of the world's working hours, but of the 1.3 billion people who live in abject poverty around the globe, women make up 70% of that figure. Poverty here doesn't just mean scarcity and want. It means rights denied, opportunities curtailed, and voices silenced. Can women are not less uh, intelligent than their male contemporaries. They are not less important than their male contemporaries. And they are not inferior in any form than their male contemporaries. They can do much, much better in governance. They can do much, much better in policy and decision making. And they can do much, much better in administration. Uh, women are being marginalized, you know, generally. And um, you get to discover that um, they don't play a prominent role. But um, I think that has to do with our, 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 our traditional belief that uh, men should always play the lead role. But on the contrary, you get to discover that women sometimes could meet up with men in terms of uh, intellectual ability, in terms of um, political understanding and all that. So by and large, I think it's high time we begin to sensitize the entire uh, community all across Africa about the need for us to allow women to play major, I mean, prominent role. In Ethiopia, Bethlehem Tilawum is a footwear mogul whose shoe company Soul Rebels grossed $2 million in sales this past year. Tilawum has joined the list of a cresting wave of female African entrepreneurs who are harnessing Africa's businesses and brands. Entrepreneur is in my blood, I believe. <laughs> when I started Soul Rebels, I didn't know that it's going to be big like this. I grew up in a small family and my family was like supporting me to do things by myself. So it, it, it grew on me and when I think about that, uh, it makes me really working hard again to penetrate more markets and to create more new things. Tilawun believes women are an important part of a business. If they are educated, they really understand what the global market needs. Another woman defying the norm is South African female train driver Sharon Ferry. Ferry is one of just 13 female drivers on the GAU train, which has been called Africa's most advanced rapid train system. Through the practical training and the inductions and everything, and I went through and I was like, okay, is it really me? Am I like here? Yeah, am I really going to drive this train? Resistance may sometimes greet women entering a male-dominated world, but at a GAU train duty room at Santon, Sharon's co-workers say they are delighted to have her on board. She's a very nice lady, she's very friendly, she's very passionate. You know, anytime you ask her, every seven times she's available. So I feel like, you know, very honored to have Sharon as one of our lady train drivers. Sharon now believes her career is on the right track. It remains to be seen how many more women will benefit from these new opportunities. In Lagos, Nigeria, the state's Waste Management Authority, as a way of experimenting, engaged the services of female truck drivers. The move proved a huge success. As far as Loma is concerned, there is no um, uh, limitation to what women can do in Loma. Every department you can have women that will work there. If women are managing the landfill site, the landfill site is a very, very harsh terrain. You have ladies managing the landfill site and they're doing very well. 
the biggest landfill sites in, in, in um, almost Africa right now. That's the Lucius and Dom site. It's been managed by the Navy. These female truck drivers who are undoubtedly excited at this opportunity reiterate that the move by the waste management company has been a huge source of empowerment. I was very happy seeing that I'm going to drive a truck, not a car. Because my thought was they said driver, so I was thinking it's a car. So getting there, even seeing those trucks, because they are new ones. We are employed purposely because of the truck driver, drivers. So I so much love to, ah, am I the one who's going to drive this truck? Very beautiful, if you see. It was very beautiful, so everybody was happy. Happened at Okbebi. When we were in a traffic there, the woman, the woman even, my distance to her, I was ahead of her. She came down. He said she had been look, watching me since. But he had the chance of seeing me that day, face to face. She now came down. She gave me something. She hugged me. In fact, she was happy that day. Driving is not the only profession experiencing the female invasion. Nimi is not your average hairstylist in the center of Nigeria's commercial state, Lagos. She is a barber and loves her job. I've always loved barbering, like when I see a good haircut. Like this one now is very, very fine and well defined. I know when you go, you go some, you go to some other places, you just see their, um, the person that gives them their friction will make the friction so wobbly. It's, it's sometimes it's like this. This side is coming down, this side is going up. They don't do it well or they take the hairline in too much. And when I see all those things, I'm like, oh, I can do this thing. Now. Let me try it and I'll do it very, very well. So that's how I got into battle. Talking about her job and the challenges she has faced, Nimi is unnerved by tradition. Some people will come, they'll tell you, no, a woman has never touched my hair. A woman has never touched my head. I don't want a woman to touch my head. I ain't so sure she knows how, what she's doing. I don't think he can cut my hair well. And some will come in and say, well, oh, a lady, let me give her a try and see. She could be good. And then some of you say, ah, they're traditionalists. Too. They don't do that where they are from. Some will say they are chiefs, they are elders. So a woman shouldn't touch their head and all that. These women are redefining their world. Despite reports that reveal women earn only 10% of the world's income and own less than 1% of the world's property, Women like Bethlehem and others are proving that no single gender owned the world. With the upward economic, social and political trajectory of the continent, a new breed of African women continues to emerge. So much so that the African Union has christened the years 2010 to 2020 as the African Women's Decade. As Africa continues to rise, so do the African women. It's amazing to see women do take up greater roles in the society. I mean, a female truck driver and baba, and they're proud of what they're doing. With me in the studio to further discuss the need to empower African women is Bosse Ironsi from Women's Rights and Health Project. Thanks for coming, Bosse. You saw the documentary on the female truck driver, Baba and Shoemaker. What are your thoughts on it exactly? Well, I think it's a welcome idea. Okay. Uh, Africa is, um, I mean, globally, women are coming up with ideas and, you know, work that can, you know, put food on the table. So mm -hmm. it's, it's a good, it's a welcome idea. Yes. I'm happy about it, that women are bracing up to the challenges of the financial meltdown that is going yes. on globally. So it's a welcome idea. Yes, that's a wonderful yeah. one. So what advice do you have for African women who are still limited by culture and tradition? Uh, straight thing, they need to uh, let loose. They yeah. need to come out from the belief and the tradition that says that women cannot go beyond where they are you know, mm. be beyond their limitations. Yes. I think they should, they should look at what is happening globally 
I know that the men cannot do it alone. Okay, so they need to contribute beyond just being a pizza farmer. They should try new, new, break new grounds. Exactly, you exactly. know, to should break new grounds mm. to be able to do something better because just as the men have the brain to read, they have the brain to do everything, so so is the women. They are created the way we are created, so we shouldn't limit ourselves by those traditions and cultures that says you cannot go beyond what it is, uh, you know, where you are limited. But I think if the women are given the right uh, 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 platform, the right opportunity, they create the right environment, they will go places. That's really good. Yeah. That's really good. Yeah. Thank you, Bosse, for coming on our program here today. Really appreciate your presence here. Thank really you nice. Very much. Thank, Thank you. you very much. There we have it. The need to empower women cannot be overemphasized. And for the African women, continue to dare to break new grounds. It's time now to take a look at news making headlines in the world of women. As part of efforts to change how Senegal produces and consumes energy, the World Bank, in collaboration with the Africa Energy Access Program, are providing cleaner cooked stoves and rural electrification in some of the country's remote areas. In a way, Senegal's energy transformation starts here, with Maimouna Dien preparing a family meal at her home on the outskirts of the capital, Dakar. Through the program, the stoves are manufactured and sold at a reduced cost by local women, providing opportunity for female entrepreneurs while helping to protect the environment. Egyptian women are taking action to try and curb sexual harassment, an issue that has been pushed under the carpet for years. At Cairo's crowded demonstrations, many women say they have been pushed, groped or worse, and with the authorities reluctant to take action against the perpetrators, women are now taking practical steps to protect themselves. Uh, I think it's vital for every girl or woman, whatever age, um, the situation here is getting worse in Egypt. It happened to my mother, it happened to my friends, um, all types of uh, harassment. Um, and it's a point where you know you have to look out for yourself because there, really, there, there isn't anyone who you can really trust in the streets anymore. Self-defense coach Raimi Jeria Lachinian said it was vital for women not to go to protests alone. The Egyptian Penal Code stipulates that indecent assault by force or threat is punishable by hard labor for three to seven years. But with action rarely taken to punish the perpetrators, the problem remains widespread. South African President Jacob Zuma has spoken out against rape and the pandemic of violence against women in the country. Over. 64,000 cases of rape were reported to the police last year. The Minister of Police did indicate last year, when releasing crime statistics, that while the levels of serious crime had decreased, but the levels of sexual assault were of serious concern. We have come together to say that these horrendous attacks must stop. Zuma said youngsters bore the brunt of most sexual assaults that have blighted the country. At schools, in many ways a reflection of broader society, girls can fall prey to sexual abuse, bullying and rape in the classroom and playground. It's time for a break now, and when we come back, it's the Life on Top segment.
she's young, bold, fearless, intelligent, on Life on Top today, we'll meet a young lady who has done what most people would have thought impossible. Whoever coined the term, it's a man's world, has probably not met Ola or Rekunri. Her life has been an embodiment of innovation, success and excellence. Born in a village in England and of Nigerian parentage, Orakuri made history at the age of 21 by becoming one of the youngest medical doctors in England. Why I decided to come back to Nigeria um, was because my younger sister, so this is not the same sister, another sister became very, very sick um, in Nigeria and she actually needed an air ambulance. So um, obviously we're all on the phone trying to find an air ambulance, phoning in around in Nigeria if anybody could find one. We couldn't find one in Nigeria and she was critically ill. So we decided to spread out our search and look within West Africa. So uh, we tried to phone some services in Ghana, um, phone some services in Togo, Syria alone, Gambia. And we actually could not find a single air ambulance service. So eventually um, we looked in South Africa and this is like a seven journey, uh, hour journey away and we found an air ambulance that could do the transfer. Um, but they would be activated in 12 hours time. So we actually had more like a 20 hour wait time. Um, and before we could get the air ambulance to Nigeria, my sister actually died and it was a really difficult time for me. Um, I, I really questioned whether I was doing the right thing by staying in England and these things that are so simple, to, these issues that are so simple to solve in, um, in the UK were so difficult here. Now at 27, Ola is the founder of Flying Doctors Nigeria, an air ambulance service based in the country's commercial state, Lagos. I, I can laugh now, but I used to cry every day then. I didn't, I, I, you know, when I look back, I wonder what on earth I was thinking because I didn't even know anybody. I had no idea about the country. I had no idea about the way the system worked. And I just decided to come. <laughs> and I mean, I, I was going for these meetings, these completely fruitless meetings, going to Abuja on the night bus, um, and coming back with nothing, you know, making these huge sacrifices and gradually spending through everything that I'd worked so hard to get in England. But I was absolutely thoroughly determined to do it. And I set a goal. I said that in 12 months, if nothing happens with this business, then I'm going to pack up and go home. Luck happens at the interchange, the crossing between preparation and where preparation meets opportunity. So by that time, I'd done so much research about air ambulance, so much research about emergency medicine. I had my equipment, I had everything. I just could not find anybody that wanted the service. So I was, I'd had another fruitless meeting on the island at, um, where was it? Southern Sun, one of these places on the island. And I was walking out of the hotel feeling like really, really disheartened. And um, this guy was sitting down just by the side in the lobby. And he said, oh, you know, hi, what's your name? And, you know, how all these like old, old men in Nigeria do. And I was like, oh, you know, my name's Ola. Um, you know, I run this air ambulance. And he was like, oh, let me have your number. Maybe we can, we can go for a drink sometime. And I, I thought about it. Right, and I just thought, I know what this guy wants and I know what I want. Now, and this is one lesson I learned, that what the other person wants is not necessarily what you want. You have to teach them what you want. So I gave him my card and never heard from him until three o'clock, I met him on the Sunday, until three o'clock in the morning on the Wednesday. Call came in random number. I picked up the number and said, I'm the guy that you met in this hotel. And I said, okay, what, what, can, I, what can I do for you at three o'clock in the morning? He said, please, can you help me? 
my son is very very sick and I have no idea what to do and South Africa are telling me that it's going to take two days for them to get here and he's dying what can you do now this was a big dilemma for me but at the time I didn't actually have that watch on ground but I knew somebody that had an aircraft so I said don't worry we'll do it my experience you just need a lot of passion a lot of drive and a really strong reason a really painful reason a reason that it was pain that got me up every morning um, I didn't really have that much of a business plan I didn't have the funding I didn't even know how to find finances I had no MBA I had no idea about business but what I had was as in the most painful thing that can ever happen to a person driving me every day to get up. We live in a society that actually is geared to keeping women down and what that society doesn't know is that until women move up the nation cannot move up. But more women graduate than men worldwide from university and we outperform men academically. So it's now how do we translate that into outperforming in the workplace? And it's a combination of government legislation and intervention. It's a combination of education for women. And it's an education, it's also, also a matter of workplaces, also making the environment comfortable enough for women. But I think education and a change in mindset is also key, especially in Africa, to making these things possible. Ola Orekuri is someone young African women should emulate. She saw a need and went the extra mile to meet it, thereby saving countless lives. Nigerian weddings are renowned for their glamour. On Trends Today, we'll be looking at what weddings look like among the three major tribes in Nigeria. Traditional marriage ceremonies in Nigeria date back centuries and come in various forms as a result of the country's diverse culture. The colorful events generally differ in grandeur depending on the fund and the distinctive nature of the three major ethnic groups holding it, the Yoruba in the southwest, Igbo in the east and Hausa Fulani in the north. The ceremonies in all the marriages begin with the introduction of the couple's parents, after which the family of the groom brings items demanded by the bride's family in line with the traditional demands for approval. Among the Yoruba of Western Nigeria, when the dowry, also known as the bride price, is paid, tradition says such money is to be offered but not totally accepted because it brings to mind dues paid by colonial slave masters called the Oruri in local parlance for the purchase of slaves. We are not selling our daughter. So what we just want is that the, the uh, husband should take proper care of her. So that is the uh, most important thing. The procedure among the Igbo of Eastern Nigeria has now been modified. In the past, diverse marriage procedures were dictated by the many tribes that make up the ethnic group. This is how it works. First, the man presents his interest before the bride's family. Both families later investigate each other, meet and agree, while the bride's family provides a list of traditional requirements for the marriage. The bride price is finally paid. It is those elders, that eldest man that will be fixing this price, the dowry. The father will be there. No woman is around there. No woman, women don't stay around that place. After telling them how much you want them to pay, it varies you from place to place, this dowry. In my area, even if you have a degree, 
The family may say you give us 100 naira or 5,000 naira. And no, when they say 5,000 naira, it means they are just giving you the baby, the girl, free. And some people do it because they don't want problem. Maybe when the girl leave, maybe they have asked you 500,000, they are looking for 500,000 to pay you back. And the wine carrying ceremony in Bangkuai is conducted. <laughs> If, however, there is a divorce, the bride price is returned. Divorce have stages. If you are married to a man, he divorced you because you were not able to raise any child. The man who married you and paid dowry, your family is still indebted to that man. The man's are made, pay back what we gave you as dowry. It's for the house of Fulani in the north, it is believed that marriage cannot be totally separated from the Islamic religion. It's so bad. By a dirty man within themselves, immediately understandable. The fifth day, and before the day, prepare for uh, uh, cola nut and some sweet and some a little amount for a traditional marriage, they call uh, our muallims or imam to come and call them them. They do marriage and they hand over the wives or the parents of the grand. Irrespective of the differences, certain elements cut across traditional marriages in Nigeria. Also of interest and common in all the marriages is the use of uniform clothing known as the Ashwebi in local parlance. Everybody comes together, you see them on the same color, on the same kind of dress. It's, it's like a pass to, to the wedding. It may not be original to every Nigerian society, but it has come to stay. But the traditional weddings do not come cheap, contrary to belief in some quarters. Okay, do you both want to tell me uh, something little about the cost implication of this wedding? Oh! Cost? Yes. Oh, I, 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 well, no, no, she, 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 I, I, I don't know how to quantify, but let me just tell you, from, this, from the day we chose the date, we, we picked the date like three mo two months ago, we've been spending, 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 spending. Though the cost of traditional weddings may be negotiated, the rights are the non-negotiable first step a couple must take before other forms of weddings in Nigeria. Wow, very colorful. Nigerian weddings are without a doubt colorful events. Just before we go, let's remind you about how special you are. In the words of Amaritia Sen, a Nobel laureate and founder of UNDP's Human Development Index, empowering women is key to building a future we want. To Jawaharlal Nero, you can tell the condition of a nation by looking at the status of its women. With that, we have come to the end of today's episode. Do join us again, same time next week. I am Oinola Salim. Thank you.